Today's Australia is famous for its dangerous wildlife, from crocs in murky rivers to venomous jellyfish off the coast. Yet there was once a prehistoric age when water was the safer choice. On land, giant reptiles, brutal marsupials, and wild climate swings forced creatures to fight for every breath. Let's find out how ancient Australian seas became a surprisingly gentle refuge. Long ago, the landmass that would become Australia looked very different. It wasn't a desert continent with scattered forests. Instead, it was part of a larger tectonic arrangement that allowed inland seas to flood big parts of the continent. Warm ocean waters spread across low-lying regions, transforming the heart of Australia into a shallow sea teeming with marine creatures. This era saw wild temperature changes. Some regions baked under strong sun, while storms drenched others. The distribution of plants was uneven. Lush green belts popped up where rainfall was steady, but dryness took over further inland. Fossil records show that animals constantly migrated to find shelter or water. Rivers wound across broad plains, feeding wetlands or deltas. Over time, small changes in sea level had big effects on local ecosystems. Volcanic and tectonic activity also played a part. Rifts and shifts in the Earth's crust sometimes created natural basins that filled with ocean water. Where these basins formed, an inland sea came to life. Muddy shorelines offered new habitats for many species. While modern Australia often suffers from harsh deserts, these prehistoric basins attracted life in abundance. However, that same richness drew fierce predators on land, each claiming territory near the watery edges. Besides the scattered forests and wetlands, open plains stretched across large swaths of Australia. Some places were cooler than we might expect, thanks to ocean currents and shifts in global climate. High oxygen periods also let certain animals grow bigger and more active. These conditions fueled competition, making land a place of daily battles. Herbivores had to keep moving or face starvation. Carnivores followed close behind. In that environment, dryness could hit hard. Rivers might vanish in droughts, creating waterholes that turned into death traps, packed with predators lying in wait. Even if some animals found a patch of greenery, they risked meeting giant reptiles or large marsupial hunters. Meanwhile, off in the distance, the inland sea offered a stable mix of water temperature and food. Creatures that ventured into those waters often escaped the constant drama on land. So, early Australia was no quiet Eden. The mosaic of climates, plus frequent tectonic changes, formed a tough place to live. Many species adapted to life at the interface, searching for food and water but sleeping on shore. Over generations, these transitions shaped an environment where the land's fury seemed endless and the calm under the waves turned into a far safer bet. Walking across prehistoric Australia meant entering a realm of big predators and fierce struggles. Fossil evidence shows that land-dwelling reptiles reached intimidating sizes. Some soared to the top of the food chain, with jaws that could crush bone or claws sharp enough to disembowel smaller prey. Meanwhile, large amphibians lurked near riverbanks, waiting for anything foolish enough to approach. Even a simple trek to drink water could end in disaster. Beyond big beasts, the environment itself was punishing. Droughts lasted for months or years, baking the soil and killing off plants. Forest fires flared when lightning hit dry leaves, leaving scorched fields behind. If that wasn't enough, sudden floods from seasonal rains could drown entire valleys. Survivors of these events faced fresh threats, hungry carnivores drawn by stranded prey or rotting carcasses. Competition among herbivores also grew dangerous. Some large plant eaters developed thick armor or deadly horns to defend themselves from both predators and rivals. Skirmishes over scarce feeding grounds left skeletons with shattered limbs or lethal wounds. Early marsupial lions and giant carnivorous kangaroos, if present in certain epochs, added another layer of dread. They might ambush weaker creatures or scavenge the remains left behind by bigger killers. The day-to-day -day struggle shaped an unforgiving land. Every trip for water, shade, or fresh grass involved risks. Animals needed keen senses just to make it through the night. Tracks left in old mudflats reveal sudden changes in direction, as if a creature sensed a predator at the last moment. Many skeletons come with unhealed bite marks, proving how quickly land-based battles occurred. The phrase, survival of the fittest, seems tailor-made for that kind of everyday chaos. Climate shifts only increased tensions. A sudden drop in temperature could drive multiple species into the same valley, triggering conflicts. A shift to scorching heat might force them to chase each other toward the remaining water holes. New arrivals from evolving lineages might overrun weaker animals or carve out hunting zones. In such a savage place, rest was a luxury. No wonder some animals turned to the water to escape. Those living fully on land faced constant fights and hunts. The inland seas with their calmer habits must have seemed like a relief. 
As the land turns savage from dryness, storms, or apex hunters, the sea's challenges appeared mild in comparison. While not a perfect paradise, the water at least offered a break from the crushing dangers on shore. As sea levels climbed during this part of Earth's past, low-lying sections of Australia filled with salt water. Scientists call this the Arama Sea an expansive, shallow sea that covered huge territories once thought to be solid land. We can imagine rolling waves spreading across deserts, turning dusty plains into marine habitats. Rivers connected inland zones with the open ocean, feeding nutrients into these newly flooded basins. Even though it was an inland sea, it was large enough for big marine predators to thrive. Warm, shallow waters nourished plankton blooms, supporting schools of fish. Some areas might have grown thick seaweed or aquatic plants, giving small creatures hiding spots. Gentle coastlines formed, letting animals walk in and out of the water easily. Over time, this watery domain stretched so far that the boundary between land and sea blurred. Conditions in the Arama Sea were not uniform. Some parts stayed murky due to sediment runoff, while others cleared up in calmer spots. Shifting currents and tides produced varied microhabitats, from quiet lagoons to mildly brackish zones near river mouths. Each zone attracted different animals. Some fish specialized in brackish waters, others stuck to saltier regions. The entire sea functioned like a buffet for marine life, from small crustaceans to large marine reptiles. For land creatures, the Arama Sea offered a means of escape. If threatened, they might seek safety in shallow waters, knowing many land-based predators disliked swimming. Indeed, not all big carnivores adapt well to aquatic life. Some might wade in for a quick drink but feel out of their element beyond a certain depth. In contrast, certain amphibious animals took advantage of the sea for food or shelter, spending much of their day afloat. Eventually, the sea's presence reshaped the entire region. Moisture from its surface might have altered local rainfall patterns, giving pockets of lush vegetation near the shoreline. Animals drawn by green plants discovered safer foraging or more stable climates next to the water. Meanwhile, deeper in the inland sea, marine reptiles roamed widely, seldom clashing in the same savage way we see with land predators. They had space, resources, and fewer savage brawls. Thus, the Arama Sea became the great equalizer in a hostile land. By offering a broad, watery expanse, it broke the cycle of dryness and violence. Creatures that found a way to live with the waves, even part-time, suddenly gained relief from the endless hunts and battles on land. It became a haven where animals could feed, breed, and drift away from the relentless conflicts beyond the shore. Inside the Arama Sea, a rich variety of marine life found its place. Large predators like pliosaurs commanded the deeper sections. They boasted massive heads and flippers, preying on anything smaller that came near. Although fierce, they typically went after fast fish or unsuspecting creatures. This style of hunting, while deadly, was usually quick. No drawn-out territorial war you'd witness among land beasts. Chronosaurus was possibly the star predator, known for its jaw strength and big appetite, Fossils suggest it grew to impressive lengths, yet it tended to focus on targets it could kill swiftly. Rather than roam around chasing rivals, it seemed to roam solo or in small groups, ambushing fish or other reptiles. This lifestyle, though not gentle, avoided the chaotic daily fights that ravaged the land. Schools of fish, from small feeders to medium-sized swimmers, filled many shallower spots. They used camouflage to blend with the seafloor or traveled in large shoals to reduce individual risk. Rays and early sharks patrolled some mid-level depths, focusing on isolated prey items like crustaceans or bony fish. The result was an ecosystem where these predators hunted with skill, but rarely caused the sort of mass panic or violent struggles that we see in large herds birds or packs on land. Plesiosaurs, with their long necks and gentle flippers, slid through the water searching for smaller fish or squid-like creatures. Their feeding method centered on stealth, snapping up prey without dramatic battles. Meanwhile, smaller marine reptiles or invertebrates quietly scoured the sandy bottom for scraps. Each group had its place, forming a layered food web that balanced predation and survival. Some creatures combined partial land visits with life in the Arama Sea. Primitive turtles or amphibious reptiles might come ashore to lay eggs or bask, yet they spend most of their time under the waves. Protected by aquatic conditions, they avoided the hostile land dwellers that roamed beyond the beach. And if they encountered a Chronosaurus or Pliosaur, they had ways to hide or scurry among reefs, something not possible on the open ground. All in all, the Arama Sea world was not free of conflict, but it didn't match the savage drama on land. Fights under the water ended fast, and most marine animals had less reason to kill out of sheer competition. The stable resources, like ample fish, kept them satisfied. This arrangement proved far safer than the daily hunts and scuffles that tormented the neighboring land. 
In that sense, diving beneath the surface often saved a life that would have ended in dust and claws above. The difference between land and water risk was clear. On land, a single valley might host giant theropods, huge amphibians, and packs of carnivorous marsupials or reptiles, all competing for diminishing resources. Dry spells or local floods made conditions shift without warning. At any moment, an animal might face the jaws of a predator it never expected. This constant tension led to daily violence. Meanwhile, in the sea, confrontation was usually swift or avoided altogether. Yes, Kronosaurus or big pliosaurs could kill with one bite, but they did so for food not territory. A fish that sensed danger might simply school or flee. Cecil organisms like shellfish or corals faced minimal conflict if they secured a steady location. Predators in these waters targeted an individual meal and then moved on. The mental strain on land creatures must have been huge. Fossil evidence shows heavy scarring, repeated injuries, and mass death events tied to both predators and climate extremes. Surviving each day meant outrunning or outsmarting multiple threats. By contrast, marine animals lived in a fluid environment where food was spread more evenly, giving them fewer reasons to clash. Even large marine hunters rarely waste energy on extended fights. The climate also treated the sea more gently. Shallow waters in the Arama Sea might warm or cool, but not in the violent ways land climates did. Coastal temperatures softened extremes. Animals there found relative comfort if they stuck to the zone that best fit their tolerance. On land, slight temperature changes could push herbivores to new areas, triggering competition among predators. That never really happened under the water. Food chains stayed stable, letting fish, cephalopods, and marine reptiles maintain their roles. When we compare fossil trackways, it becomes evident that land animals often ran from or fought with each other, leaving deep claw marks and chaotic patterns. Marine fossils show more intact remains, with less sign of repeated aggression. Many were eaten, sure, but not in a prolonged, warlike sense. Each kill ended quickly. Another day, the same predator might hunt in a different part of the sea, not needing to defend turf. Thus, for an animal that could choose, stepping off the land into the sea might feel like stepping out of a war zone into relative calm. Big hunts still happened, but nobody was locked in constant, brutal combat. In that special era, water provided a respite from the endless stress that churned above ground. Over millions of years, Earth's climate and geology never stayed the same. Shifts in sea level caused by changes in temperature or ice volume affected the size of the Arama Sea. At its height, that inland sea spread across wide sections of Australia's interior. But later, tectonic movements lifted some areas while global cooling locked water in polar ice. This gradually shrank the Arama Sea, turning once salt salty basins into grasslands or swampy marshes. As the sea receded, animals that relied on aquatic safety had to adapt. Marine reptiles that once navigated quiet bays found themselves with fewer routes to roam. Some fish species possibly vanished, while others moved to the receding edges. Along the changing coastlines, new land areas formed, fresh habitats opened up, allowing land dwellers to wander in. Over time, land-based predators expanded their territories. Some adapted to wet prairies or muddy wetlands, hunting near the old shoreline. At the same time, global conditions also changed. Volcanic eruptions or greenhouse gas fluctuations could raise average temperatures, intensifying droughts. Cooling periods might produce short bursts of abundant vegetation, which in turn supports large herbivores. Each shift shaped who thrived and who died. Sometimes these changes brought an advantage to land predators. If vegetation in coastal zones lessened, herbivores had to cluster around the water's edge. That made them easier prey. In addition, the planet's shifting land masses influenced ocean currents. Once isolated seas might connect to bigger oceans, bringing fresh water or new predators. If big marine reptiles arrived from elsewhere, it might balance out the environment. Instead of Kronosaurus dominating alone, newcomers could compete or drive different feeding behaviors. This interplay sometimes renewed the sea's ecosystem, but it also meant higher stakes for local species. Eventually, as the Arama Sea drained further, the difference between land and water safety faded. More land formed, and the once harsh inland deserts and coastal swamps turned into evolving habitats for new species. Meanwhile, the reduced water space is concentrated on marine animals, increasing predator-prey conflicts in a smaller sea. In the end, that fleeting period when water overshadowed land and safety slipped away. 
replaced by the usual dynamic where giant ocean predators took the top risk factor. This story of water being safer than land highlights how dynamic Earth's history can be. Many of us view marine realms as the final frontier of terrifying beasts like great white sharks or saltwater crocs. Yet in ancient Australia, the land carried the real nightmares. Fossil clues remind us that each age in prehistory had its own rules about who ruled where and which habitats offered peace. Studying fossils from the Arama Sea helps scientists understand how animals adapt to big shifts. Some land dwellers ventured into the shallows. Some smaller sea creatures thrived under the protection of murky waters. Others, like large pliosaurs, didn't need to wage all-out war every day, so their type of conflict stayed short and direct. Meanwhile, land carnivores had no shortage of rivals. Every waterhole or dense forest might house something bigger, meaner, or more desperate. This ancient scenario gives us insights into how life deals with extreme pressures. When land got too hot or too crowded with dangerous predators, water-based solutions appeared. Animals might develop amphibious traits or move near coastal zones. Over generations, the calmer marine environment fosters more stable feeding cycles. The result? A surprise era in which the land was the bigger death trap, while the sea saw less daily aggression. It also challenges our assumptions about ecosystems. We often think water predators stand at the top of fearsome lists, but the environment matters. If the land is going through severe dryness, intense climate swings, and a blossoming of large, violent predators, then the ocean can seem relatively mild by comparison. Even if Kronosaurus lurked beneath the waves, at least it wasn't as chaotic as the constant land battles for survival. This story should remind us that Earth's ecology isn't fixed. The planet rearranges land, floods continents, and shifts climate in cycles far beyond our modern experiences. Animals respond by migrating, adapting, or going extinct. In the slice of time that shaped the Arama Sea, many found safety under the waves. Eventually, as climate changed again, the puzzle reworked itself. But for that special moment, water gave a gentler path to life, defying the usual assumption that land is safer. Ancient Australia reversed our modern fears. The land turned vicious while the seas stayed calmer. Giant land predators, punishing climates, and endless fights contrasted with the watery realm, where hunts were swift and less chaotic. Does this story change how you see Australia's past? Share your thoughts below. If this glimpse into a time when waves offered safety fascinated you, please like, comment, and subscribe for more journeys into Earth's forgotten ages. Thank you for watching, and see you on our next deep dive into history, shown on screen.